from our dis the introduction of our distinguished speaker today. So, Rory, can we uh, turn down the lights just a tiny little bit, please? All right, great. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, fantastically special occasion, especially the people on Zoom. I know a lot of Jackie's friends and family outside of our own community are there, so welcome. Um, it's really, you know, a special thing for a professor to have a student finish. It's one of the great, wonderful things about the jobs that we have. It's even better when they are completely finished and they've actually submitted their dissertation. So I'm not going to be too long, but I, but I have to say a few things. Oh, come on, that doesn't want to work. Ready to click on that? What what button? Nothing wants to turn. In a minute. Just try it. Oh, go back. Oh. Go back. Now try it. Hey. Now try it. Yeah. There we go. So I've known Jackie for over a decade, and this is the earliest photo that we could find, courtesy of Monica Albee. This is from the summer of 2010 when Jackie was first working in the prep lab, and it exemplifies her first true love, which of course are herbs. <laughs> but as you will see, we were quick to corrupt her as soon as, as soon as she took IB-104. This is our final field trip on IB-104 with Jackie holding a baby barn owl. And this exemplifies, you can see Jackie's expression, her enthusiasm about working with animals. So Jackie was an undergrad here. Once she graduated from here, she moved across country to Villanova, where she completed a master's degree with Aaron Bauer. And Aaron introduced her to working in Africa, which has formed a core of everything Jackie has done subsequently. So she's a specialist on African lizards. Um, and then subsequently, we're going to hear about some of the work she's done on birds. Jackie has also been in the field with me. And this made me realize that um, I have to be really careful what pictures I show because, uh, you know, what comes around goes around. <laughs> so I try and be in the field with every one of my students. The pandemic was really, really challenging for everyone. And so Jackie and I never got the opportunity to go to Africa together to work on the core focal tax of a dissertation. But we did go to Indonesia together. Indonesia is fantastic trips. They're incredibly time intensive. You don't get a lot of sleep. This is our field camp, Jackie hard work prepping birds. But they do come with some sweet rewards, such as seeing amazingly diverse species, such as this beautiful kingfisher from Sulawesi. Occasionally, some of the whoop, occasionally, let me go back, let me go back. Occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, some of the people we take in the field are very bad, corrupting influences <laughs> on the younger generations. Um, this is about the most innocent photo I could find. So I'll leave it up. I'll leave it up to your imagination. But I want to call out one other thing about Jackie that um, is not always apparent about our PhD students is that Jackie is an incredible mentor. I've rarely met somebody who is as invested in helping her undergraduate students gain meaningful research experiences by investing time in every single one of those individuals. These are, um, as Jackie terms, the Weaver girls, some of the <laughs> early students who played a pivotal role in helping her collect data that ended up being really important with the pandemic hit because it allowed her to work on that part of her dissertation while many other things had to stop. And then this is Elisa, who's actually here, who during the latter parts of her dissertation played a really important role. And she'll be starting grad school in Princeton in the fall. They're very exciting. I also have to say that it's an incredibly proud moment to have Jackie giving her finishing talk, but it's also a relief. <laughs> by, my, by my best estimate during her dissertation, Jackie and I exchanged 1,368 emails. <laughs> Indeed, she's a lady who knows how to get what she wants. <laughs> so I'm going to stop on that note, uh, but just say we're really looking forward to hearing about your work. It's an awesome dissertation, and I couldn't be prouder. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I need to get out of this. Uh... Center. There we go. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming to today's talk. Uh, and thank you, Rory, for that very lovely and uh, 
No, I didn't put any embarrassing photos of you in my, but <laughs> I'm sort of regretting that now. Uh, um, but yes, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Rory. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about my dissertation research on the evolution of nest architecture in weaver birds. Um, so just to give you a brief outline of, of today's talk, I'm going to start off by giving you some background on weavers and their nests. I'll go into uh, the focus of my first chapter, which was on evolutionary patterns of nest design in weavers. Uh, then I'll go into chapter two, which looked at the co-evolution between bill shape and weaver nests. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, the last chapter that I did looking at revisiting the weaver phylogeny using a phylogenomics approach. And that'll, uh, and that'll end the talk. If, if it'll let me advance. Okay, so moving on to uh, uh, the background on weaver's nests. So nest structures are widespread across animals. Uh, they are uh, usually temporary structures used to protect eggs uh, and developing young. Um, and as I said, a, a lot of species, especially invertebrates, make, make some sort of nest, but even invertebrates do too. Um, but uh, bird, bird nests are really the most complex and diverse of any vertebrate group. Uh, with the exception of obligate brood parasites, nearly every single species of bird uh, built, constructs a nest. Uh, and this is largely due to the fact that all birds lay eggs. And so building a nest is a requisite part of the earliest developmental stages in avian life history. Um, and so uh, bird nests vary quite a bit with their appearance and construction. So they can vary in form and shape from being very simple straight nests, uh, like those of many shorebirds, uh, to sort of brambled nests nest of many uh, birds of prey, as well as the cup nests of many uh, songbirds and passerine species. They can vary in material and size. Some are constructed with vegetative material. Others are made with things like mud or artificial, uh, artificial materials as well. Um, and they can also vary in, the, in locations, their placement in the physical environment. A lot of birds place their nests in trees or bushes, but some can put them in water. Some birds even put their nests underground in burrows. So start, uh, let me introduce you to uh, the weaver bird family. So this is the Placidae. Uh, weavers are sparrow-sized songbirds. There are about 118 species distributed across 16 different genera, and they're found mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but there are species that occur in tropical parts of Southeast Asia and on islands in the Indian Ocean. Um, but as their namesake implies, what makes weavers really fascinating and has made them the subject of intrigue and curiosity to naturalists and scientists for over a century are their nests. And I think this quote by Herbert Friedman, uh, who was the former curator of ornithology at the Smithsonian, uh, really exemplifies this. It's, it is among the weaver birds that we find the art of nest building developed to its greatest perfection. Um, and so, you can really see the incredible diversity of this family in this <laughs> illustration by the artist Mamoru Suzuki, which uh, he actually made for my dissertation. And that just highlights some of the really beautiful, amazing uh, structures across, across the family. And I actually brought two weaver bird nests too for people to look at and pass around the room. So these are uh, two nests from uh, the African weavers. Uh, and if you look, uh, if you take a close look at them, you can really pay attention to the types of knots and all the intricate weaving that's done to make these amazing structures. Um, so, as I said, weavers build some of the most diverse and elaborate nests of any avian family. They can range, uh, uh, they can range tremendously in size. Some are about, you know, football size. Uh, most are, are football size, but they can be as large as these massive haystack-like nests that can be so big that they can cause telephone poles to completely uh, collapse under their weight. Um, some nests are very tightly woven. Others are a bit messier, like these uh, messy uh, brambles of sticks, like many uh, 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 sparrow weavers and buffalo weavers. Uh, some species attach their nests from the bottom. Some use side attachments or top attachments to hang their nests. And finally, some nests have uh, added structures like tubes or spouts, um, as you can see in these hanging nests of bio weavers, as well uh, in the uh, Plosius nest in the bottom left. Combined with uh, uh, 
the incredible diversity of nest design weavers, this amazing phenotypic behavioral and ecological diversity across the family. So if you combine this, uh, this incredible diversity with their nests, they really are a model system for studying the evolution of nest design in birds. So now that I've given you some background, I'm gonna move into my first chapter. And uh, this, this chapter is titled <laughs> Evolutionary Patterns of Nest Design and Weaver. So really just going at the core of my um, central interest, which is studying evolutionary patterns of nest design across the family. So one of the things that's most intriguing to me about bird nests is that beyond merely being a receptacle for the eggs and developing young, uh, they really are a physical manifestation of evolved behavior. And so uh, in a way, they, um, this, this, this is what makes them a part of the extended phenotype. phenotype. Yeah. Much of the research that established this concept of the nest as an extended phenotype was done by Nicholas and Elsie Kalias, uh, who, are pioneer, uh, who did a number of pioneering behavioral studies on captive weaver birds uh, while they were at UCLA. Uh, and from their work, they established that nest building is largely innate and, um, and <laughs> that uh, individuals uh, maintain the same types of uh, nest designs throughout their lifetime. So if we take all of these things together, we can establish that so avian nests are indeed ubiquitous and diverse across birds. They clearly play an incredibly important role in avian life history. And because of the work that the Cliases did, we know that some features of nest design are likely to be species specific. So this really makes them ideal characters for studies of comparative evolution. Uh, so you can study nests in a phylogenetic context to provide deeper insight into um, uh, things like uh, species diversification, ecology, and environmental adaptation. Despite this, nests are actually one of the most poorly, uh, uh, poorly understood and studied components of avian life history. And most of the phylogenetic studies that have been done on nests have been done in these large macroevolutionary scales. Uh, so, and, and because of this research, the overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming um, uh, uh, conclusions from these, from these studies is that nest design is highly conserved, uh, even among ecologically diverse clades. But there have been a few family level studies done, uh, namely on uh, swallows and in oven birds. And both of these studies were done in the 1990s. And from these studies, uh, they established two rules about nests uh, uh, as they change uh, uh, between species. So in general, nests seem to become more elaborate over time. So uh, uh, enclosed nests evolve from open cup nests and added structures like tubes and funneled entrances appear to be derived characters. So the goal of my study was to evaluate these two seemingly contradictory uh, conclusions from these uh, different types of macro and family level studies. And so towards, towards this end, I established two primary goals. The first being to uh, conduct a phylogenetic analysis of nest, of nest design in the Placidae uh, and to determine the ancestral weaver nest form uh, to test my, uh, my specific hypotheses. The first being, uh, is nest design uh, phylogenetically conserved uh, in the family. The second being, I hypothesized the ancestral weaver nest was likely a simple globular nest, and this is because uh, members of the sister family to weavers is the astrilidae, and they largely build uh, simple globular enclosed structures. Uh, and then uh, hypothesis three and four were that more complex nest designs are derived and character state reversions are rare, which would match uh, more of the family level studies, um, the conclusions of the, of the family level studies. Uh, so here's a general overview of my data collection uh, and analysis methods. So this, for, this work first involved going to several museum collections and actually measuring and quantifying nest design using museum specimens. And in total, I looked at over 650 nest specimens. Uh, and some of this data was uh, also provided through my collaborator, Bobby Habig, um, who, is, uh, who also measured nests at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and in total, I was able to get nest uh, uh, information on nest design from 84 species of weavers comprising so most of the family diversity. This data was supplemented from additional nest character data from literature and online uh, literature sources and online databases. And then to conduct my phylogenetic analyses, I, re I constructed a Sanger based phylogeny for the family using largely gen bank sequences available, uh, publicly available <coughs> gen bank sequences. I also uh, uh, 
included de novo mitochondrial DNA from an additional 61, in a, 61 individuals to um, build up the species uh, representation in that phylogeny. And then uh, this data was then used, all this data was then used to run maximum likelihood-based ancestral, ancestral state reconstruction analyses of nest design. Okay. Um, so before I go into my results, I wanted to just provide a very brief overview of ancestral state reconstruction. Um, and so uh, uh, in general, the purpose of ancestral state reconstruction analyses are to uh, understand the patterns and timing of character state evolution across the tree of life. The general approach is to take measured, uh, uh, measured or scored characters from extant species, so these are the character states at the tips, uh, and then use phylogenetic methods. So you can use parsimony-based, a maximum likelihood or Bayesian analyses to infer the ancestral states. And these are the character states, the nodes between tips. And this allows you to ask questions like, what is the ancestral origin of a character? How many times has it been gained or lost? And which characters are derived versus ancestral? Um, so moving into my results, uh, so I scored nest form according to three different categories. So they were either single chambered globular nests, uh, they can be two chambered kidney shaped nests, so got my little pointer, there we go, or multi chambered compound nests. And then I included a fourth and fifth category, which were cup nests and no nests for brood parasites. And these were to score the character states of my outgroups. Uh, so moving into my results, so it appears that the ancestral weaver nest was a simple uh, single chambered globular nest and the kidney and multi-chambered compound nests are largely derived. Uh, we see two origins of compound nests and two origins of kidney shaped nests. And overall, it does appear that nest form, so this is the overall shape of nests, is highly phylogenetically conserved and largely reflects the shared, uh, shared evolutionary history of, of, of weaver root species. So moving on to nest attachment, my categories were a uh, bottom attached nest. So these are multiple attachment pieces uh, that allow the nest to sit, that the nest tends to sit on top of. These can be, uh, nests can be side attached. So these are single or parallel structures uh, that allow the nest to hang vertically. And then there are top attached nests, and these are normally nests that are attached from a single attachment point at the top, which allows them to hang off trees like really beautiful African Christmas ornaments. Um, and then finally, and then again, there was a fourth category for no attachment, and these were the brood parasites. So moving into my results, uh, it appears that the ancestral nest was either bottom or side attached. Top attached nests appear to derive uh, so the pendulous nests appear to derive from side attached nests, and, this, and these appear at least four times independently throughout the phylogeny. And we see multiple character, uh, uh, character transitions and ver reversions between each of these character states. And so uh, in general, it seems that nest attachment is largely conservative among clades, but is somewhat more evolutionarily labile than overall nest form or, ne or the shape of the nest. So my, the last character that I looked at was on the presence or absence of an entrance spatter tube. Uh, and these and these characters uh, I, I ordered from um, more to less, or uh, less, uh, uh, increasingly complex in their design. Um, so the net, the, uh, either you have a simple nest in which both structures are absent, absent, you can have a short entrance spout, or you can have a very long entrance tube. And so in this case, the ancestral weaver nest lacked an entrance spout or tube. Uh, short spouts and long tubes are derived, but uh, they are both derived from unornamented nests. So these are two independent characters. They're, and spouts are not an evolutionary stepping stone. Sorry, spouts are not an evolutionary stepping stone to elongate entrance tubes. We also see multiple gains and losses of both character types throughout the phylogeny. Uh, and most of these character state shifts appear to have occurred within the African Plosius and Molimbus, which make up about half the family diversity in the family, uh, species diversity in the family. Uh, so if we go back to the original hypotheses, um, it does appear that phylogeny plays a significant role in driving the evolution of nest design, especially in nest uh, form. Um, however, this is not a strict rule. So some aspects of nest design are more evolutionarily labile, uh, in particular, attachment style and the presence and absence of a nest tube. Uh, for my second hypothesis, 
it's clear that the ancestral weaver nest was indeed a simple globular structure. So complex nest features do appear to evolve from simpler character states. And then uh, for hypotheses three and four, again, spouts and tubes are derived. However, since we see multiple transitions and reversions between character states, this means that nests do not necessarily become more elaborated through time, as was the conclusion of the other family level studies. So coming back to my initial broader questions, how do my results fit in the framework um, of this sort of seemingly contrasting dichotomy between these two, two types of studies? Well, it seems that uh, it's not that nest design overall is phylogenetically conserved. Instead, nest form is phylogenetically conserved, even among ecologically diverse clades. Um, and then uh, looking at the family level studies, nests do not necessarily become more elaborated through times since added structures are, uh, and although added structures are derived, they may be gained or lost. Uh, and in general, this study highlights the importance of conducting comparative evolutionary studies at varying phylogenetic scales. And really what we need are more studies of nest design uh, within families, especially in bird families that build very complex nests in order to better understand generally the rules that govern the uh, patterns of character evolution of nest design across, across birds more, more generally. Okay, so moving on to chapter two. So uh, this, this chapter is Nature's Basset Weavers, the Evolution of Bill Shape and Nest Design and Weavers. Um, so just to start off briefly about avian bills, uh, the avian bill has been the subject of multiple studies of evolutionary adaptation, and this reflects the amazing morphological diversity and multifunctionality of the structure across uh, bird species. The overwhelming majority of the research that's been done has focused on the relationship between bill shape and feeding ecology, especially in adaptive radiations, uh, the most famous example being Darwin's finches. But bird bills have many more functions beyond simply feeding. They uh, aid in thermal regulation, they can be used as tools, uh, they can affect vocal modulation and the uh, pitch of, of their songs, they can aid in feather care, they also can play a role in mate signaling with species having different colored bills. Despite this rich body of research, the relationship between bill shape and nest design remains virtually unexplored, uh, even though the majority of bird species use their bills in the construction and design of their nests. Let's see. Weavers, if this, yes, it does work. Uh, it's always the risk. Um, so weavers uh, use their bills to gather and manipulate nesting materials and to fasten their nest to supporting structures. And you can really, really see this in this uh, bioweaver as it very delicately threads pieces of grass into the outer basketry of its nest. You can really see how time intensive and laborious this process is. And it is really using its bill as, an, as, as uh, it appears to be a nest building tool. So despite their name sake, not all weavers weave, uh, in fact, some species do what we would consider true weaving, uh, but other species construct their nests by, uh, by thatching. So this is a simple insertion of nesting materials. Um, nests, the nest building can also vary in the complexities as some species use really complex and uh, different types of nests, others don't. Uh, and then even among the species that weave their nests, they can really range from um, more messily to tightly woven in their design. And this may in turn be related to the types of nesting materials uh, th that are used in the construction of their nests. So given the, oops, go back. So given, uh, so given this observation that uh, birds use their bill, uh, bills in nest building, uh, and given the diversity of, of different nest building behaviors and weavers, along with their uh, observable morphological variation in bill shape, uh, this led me to ask the question, is there a co-evolutionary relationship between uh, bill shape and nest design in weaver birds? One obvious alternative hypothesis is that bill shape variation is related to diet in weavers. Uh, so weavers do range quite a bit in their diet. So some species can be granivorous, uh, some are omnivorous, 
and others are insectivorous. And there's about an equal distribution of species in each of these dietary regimes across the family. And this data uh, was uh, compiled most recently by the author Song et al. Uh, in their own study that they published last year. So the goals of this research were to look at, um, as I said, to, to look at the, the possibility that uh, nest design may play a selective force in driving bill-shaped variation in the weaver birds. So um, my first goal was to use, to, to sort of address this, this broader, uh, broader research question. My first goal was to use geometric morphometrics to characterize bill-shaped diversity across the family. Uh, and then to investigate the co-evolutionary relationships between bill morphology, nest design, and diet. And then again, my, my big question being, is diet a stronger selective pressure on bill morphology than nest design? Okay. Um, so uh, to uh, test, test these questions, uh, I collected additional nest character data so uh, this included discrete and continuous variables of nest design. So my discrete variables included diet, and I downloaded this data, data from Dryad uh, as it was published in the Song et al. paper. Um, and I also included several uh, discrete variables, or yeah, discrete variables related to nest design. So I uh, characterized nest building technique as either being thatched, loosely uh, uh, thatched or loosely woven or tightly woven, and within tightly woven. Uh, I uh, scored it as either being um, less or more complex based on the types of knots that are used in the outer basketry of the nest. Uh, I included nest attachment from, uh, uh, from chapter one, and then also added nesting materials being inflexible, fl uh, flexible, or mixed. Uh, I also measured about 14 individual variables related to metrics of nest uh, size and shape. Uh, and then this data was then used to uh, generate three measures of, ne uh, of nest um, uh, of size. So first being nest size, so this is volume. Uh, material size, so this is the average diameter of nesting materials in the nest. And then uh, material density, so the, the uh, number of individual, um, uh, the average number of uh, pieces uh, of, of uh, sorry. <laughs> the average number of nesting materials in the outer basketry of the nest. And I wanted to point out that a lot of this data was actually compiled by undergraduates. So these are undergraduates uh, that uh, conducted research as part of the undergraduate research and apprenticeship program. So Lisa Yang, Tomo Yoshino, uh, Carrie Xiao and Kirpa Singh all assisted with this. And they spent many, many hours measuring individual pieces of grass from macro photographs of Weaver and S. And so I'm very grateful that they did this. Um, and so moving on to my geometric morphometric support approach. So I, geometric morphometrics is, is a method for characterizing uh, morphology, so shape and size of an object independent of body size allometry. Um, and so for this, I included about uh, uh, over 350 uh, study skin specimens of, uh, of 63 different weavers, so about half the family diversity. And I also included uh, five males and five, me uh, five females per species, and these were all um, as best I could uh, adults, unless um, I couldn't obtain an adult sample. Um, I used standard geometric morphometric approaches to do my landmark setting and then subsequent analyses. And I used four landmarks, so, uh, so four landmarks, two curves, which are in purple, and 10 semi-landmarks along the maxilla anterior than there to characterize bill morphology. And again, a lot of the landmarking for this project was done by a URAP student. So Amanda Hayes, Rebecca Gia, Catherine Laverman, and Stephanie Ho assisted, assisted greatly with the landmarking of these specimens. I also wanted to take this time to thank three individuals. For, if I had not received assistance, this project would not have been possible. So Isaac Crone, Mackenzie, uh, Kirshner Smith and David Pauly essentially gave me a crash course in geometric morphometrics uh, and also aided a lot in the overall design of, of this project and um, statistical analysis. So I'm really, really grateful for all of the help that they gave me. So um, moving on to my results. Uh, so one advantage of ge geometric morphometrics, as I said, is that it removes the effects of allometry. Uh, and then by um, Doing a principal component analysis of your raw landmark data, uh, this analysis is performed so that you can generate um, variables of, uh, of shape that can be then used subsequently in your analyses. Um, so for my, for my data, 
uh, PC1 and PC2 overwhelm, overwhelmingly explain most of the shape variation in weaver birds. Uh, PC1 appears to uh, correspond to the relative height and length of the bill. So this is 88% of the shape variation across the weaver bird family. Uh, and, and for this measure, bills appear to range from being very conical, so uh, low PC1 values, as you can see in the bottom left here, uh, to very slender in shape, as you can see in the bottom right. So those would be high PC1 values. And then uh, for PC2, again, this is a more subtle uh, variation, but still a, a significant amount of observable variation in, in bill shape. And so this PC2 appears to correspond to the shape of the bill tip specifically. So if I wanted to define uh, what it appears to be, um, uh, what, what, sig what signal appears to be picking up, uh, it seems that negative PC2 values correspond to bills in which the anterior tomial edge, which is this area right here, is more acutely angled, resulting in a curved and narrow bill tip. Uh, and then as you go higher up on PC2 scores, you get a gradual tapering of the bill that makes the bill appear a little more um, chisel-like and straight in shape. And if we look at my actual data, so these, uh, I didn't include all of my species, otherwise it would look like a Skittle vomit rainbow plot. So I just wanted to highlight uh, four exemplar species to show sort of the, the extremes of, of, of all of, of these uh, values. So like in the most conical and straight bills, we have the thick billed weaver, um, as its name implies. Uh, on the bottom left, we have the sociable weavers, which also have a little more of a conical bill, but with a sharpened bill tip. Uh, and these are the nests that build those, these are the birds that build those giant haystack-like nests. Uh, up in the top, we have uh, Euplecti, so this is bishops and widow birds. Uh, these nests, these nests, these, uh, uh, these bills are a little bit uh, longer uh, than the more conical bills with, um, and, and straight. And then on the bottom right, you have the slender billed weaver, again, as its name implies, as a very thin, long bill with a uh, hook at the end. So these, again, here's uh, just to highlight my variables I'm using to characterize shape. And then I also included a third variable. So this is bill size uh, in geometric morphometrics. This is a centroid size. Uh, and this is, again, the overall size of the bill independent of, of body size. So to look at the relationship between bill shape and my discrete variables, I ran phylogenetic ANOVAs. The first thing to note is that there appears to be no apparent relationship between bill morphology and nest building techniques. And more specifically, it appears that bill morphology and weaving is a nest building technique. There, should, there is apparently no relationship between these two things. Um, in addition, we have uh, the, I did recover two significant, two. Uh, significant results between my, my, my variables and, and bill morphology. Um, the first being that, sorry, coming back, we do see a significant relationship between bill shape and diet, as well as in the types of nest attachments that are used. Um, and one thing to note is that these appear to uh, show significant relationships with the different axes of bill shape in weavers. So we zoom in, since I know that people can't actually see what's going on in those tiny graphs. Um, we zoom in on diet, you can see that the diet groups differ significantly in their bill slenderness, and this is a very pronounced result. Uh, and uh, if we sort of look at them more closely, so uh, green represents insectivores, purple is omnivores, and brown is granivores. Uh, and we see that insectivores have slender bill shapes in omnivore, omnivores and granivores, uh, and omnivores appear to have slender bills in those of granivores. Uh, in addition, uh, nest shape appear, nest attachment style is associated with the shape of the bill tip. So weavers that use side attachments have more hook-like bills than those that build bottom attached nests. And the reason for this might be that uh, bottom attached nests merely sit on top, uh, rest on top of their nest attachments. Whereas if you are building a nest with side attachments, you actually have to adhere the nest vertically, as I said, to single or parallel structures. So it requires a little more manipulation of the nesting materials. And if we look at the relationship between bill morphology and uh, my continuous variable or and, and the continuous variables of nest design, um, we find a positive relationship between nest volume and bill morphology across the board. And we also find a, a, a significant relationship between bill morphology and the composition of the nesting materials. Uh, so in this case, it appears that decreases in bill size are linked with increases in nesting material density, or in other words, weavers with smaller bills appear to construct denser, more tightly packed nests. 
So going back to, um, uh, to summarize my, result, my results, weaver bills appear to vary in their size, slenderness, and overall, uh, and in the shape of their bill tips. Uh, it does appear that bill morphology most strongly reflects dietary differences between species, uh, which is sort of matches the overwhelming body of literature that has looked at the relationship between uh, bill morphology uh, and, and diet and, and birds. Um, so diet appears to be driving the major difference in bill shape. It does appear that the bill secondarily function as a nest building tool. Uh, and the nest design is a selective pressure, but again, this is secondary to, to diet. And specifically, it appears that bill morphology uh, um, uh, may impact the manner in which uh, weavers uh, secure, uh, adhere their nests to their supporting structures, as well as the size and composition of their nesting materials. Uh, and so um, these results are the first to show that bill morphology in part reflect uh, the uh, multifunctionality of the avian bill as a nest building tool. So now we can add that to the long list of things that bill, uh, that uh, a long list of uh, multifunctional uses that the bill has in addition to diet. Uh, and overall, um, I think it would be really interesting to further test this hypothesis in other avian families that build complex nests uh, and in general, um, like, sorry, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, like blackbirds or the oven birds. Uh, and um, yeah, I think this is a really rich and tapped area of research that should be looked at more. Uh, so moving on to my last chapter, so weaver phylogenomics. If we can, there we go. Um, so the ability to generate large genomic data sets and non-model organisms is revolutionizing the biological sciences. And avian genomics has really been at the forefront of this renaissance with over 500 published uh, bird genomes, uh, providing insights to avian genomics, phylogenetic systematics, and the genetic bases of traits and adaptation. Uh, within the field of phylogenomics, many researchers have begun to revisit difficult phylogenetic questions that smaller, uh, uh, smaller data sets have been unable to answer. And, um, one of, and, and one of the types of uh, genomic data sets that are used are ultra-conserved elements. Uh, and these represent over 5,000 orthologous loci that can be extracted from whole genomes to revisit uh, phylogenetic questions. So for this chapter, my goals were to generate de novo whole genomes for the, uh, for the Placidae, and then to conduct the first phylogenomic analysis of weaver relationships using ECEs, as well as mitogenomes extracted from whole genomes, and then to compare my results to the Sanger-based Placidae phylogeny that made up uh, my analyses for chapter one and two. So this slide represents about uh, a good half of my lab and like actual like physical effort uh, in generating data. In fact, I spent several months over the summer in the EGL during the pandemic doing this lab work. Uh, and this involved uh, getting whole genome from 61 weaver species uh, and then um, subsequently performing bioinformatic pipelines to then uh, run my analyses and uh, get my get my results. Um, instead of making you read this, I also wanted to take this time to thank three people for who this project also would not have been possible. So Lydia Smith uh, essentially held my hand as I was doing lab work all summer. I like, thank you so much for, for helping and making sure that my very expensive lab work was successful. Uh, Fred, uh, Fred also, I think I probably sent him about a thousand emails in the last parts of my dissertation. <laughs> Uh, as he helped me with my bioinformatics. And then Elisa, I want to say, uh, so Elisa was a, a senior undergraduate student during this time, and she decided to do a badass honors thesis project looking at genomics in Estrell today for her honors thesis. And so she essentially did her lab work and her analyses in parallel with mine. And we essentially learned a lot of these techniques together. And I would not have been able to do a lot of my analyses without her because apparently I'm already an old lady and don't know how to use computers. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, all three of you for helping with this. So moving on to, uh, no last, yeah, we haven't, we'll get there in the acknowledgements. Okay, uh, so moving on to my results. 
Um, so here's the UCE tree. In general, the UCE trees were well resolved and there appeared to be no conflicts between my concatenated and summary species tree analyses. My results mostly mirror the singer based phylogeny, but again, this is with about half the family diversity. Um, although we do find a deeper placement of the buffalo weavers, uh, as along with uh, greater resolution for species level relationships among uh, the bishops and widow birds, so that's the clade Euplectes or the genus Euplectes here, uh, as well as greater resolution for species level relationships among the African Plosius. And we do see some differences in the arrangement of subclades uh, uh, between the Sanger, Sanger based phylogeny. Uh, if we look at the mitogenome tree, we find that it's mostly resolved, but with comparatively lower support than the UCE trees. And there are some key differences. It seems that the, par the sparrow weavers are paraphyletic, although their placement within the tree was generally not well supported. Uh, and the arrangement of subclades within the African Plosius and Molimbus does differ from the from the UCE tree. So these results sort of invite for exp further explanation or further exploration of uh, of the relationships using uh, genomic data. And I'm actually in the process of adding to uh, this data set by uh, taking uh, DNA samples from uh, toe pads and museum specimens, as um, the individuals that are missing were not represented by fresh tissues and museum collections. So in general, uh, we do, uh, if we uh, go back to the uh, results, so there appear to be some new phylogenomic hypotheses for the buffalo and sparrow weavers and potentially novel relationships among the Euplectes uh, species, as well as individual species within Plosius and Molimbus. Uh, and currently, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm adding to this data set. And I'm really interested in looking at the placement of two enigmatic species whose placement has continued uh, to change throughout different um, uh, different studies throughout the year. So the uh, monotypic uh, bobtailed weaver, as well as the monotypic compact weaver. One of the uh, one of the benefits of generating whole genomes as opposed to target capture uh, is that the data that you generate has utility far beyond a phylogenetic study. And indeed, I'm going to be using all of the genomes that I generated as sort of the, the basis of my postdoc that I started two weeks ago, uh, looking at the evolution of color uh, and the role that genes in the environment play in driving uh, color, variation, color variation in eggs and plumage in the weavers. So weavers, um, as I sort of highlighted before, have quite a bit of uh, feather color. And very interestingly, they have quite an array of uh, egg colors. So um, that, is, that is my current postdoc, and it is being uh, co-hosted by uh, Dr. Linnea Hall at the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology in Southern California, along with uh, Allison Schultz, who's a MBZ alum at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So moving on to the best part of the talk. Um, so before I go into uh, the more specific individual things, I do, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, all of the support that I got for uh, the research that I did. So um, yeah, you guys will get it again. So <laughs> my thesis, so first my thesis committee, Steve Weisinger, Jim McGuire, and Eileen Lacey, thank you so much for all of the really invaluable feedback that you gave me uh, as I was preparing my dissertation chapters last fall and getting ready to submit. I really appreciate the time that you took to give me all that feedback back. Um, all of the funding sources, uh, so the MVZ has funded me quite a bit. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, MVZ fellowships paid for all of the re, uh, all of the travel that I did to the museums uh, that I was able to do before the pandemic hit. So thank you so much for uh, for all that support. The Department of Integrated Biology has also been incredibly supportive, and there are people like Jill uh, Marchant um, and Monica Alby who've just been here the entire time. Oh no, I thought I wasn't going to cry. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, and then I also received quite a bit of funding from the, from NSF as well as the Philomathia Foundation, um, which was fantastic. Uh, I also am indebted to all of the curators from the museums that I visited uh, that that entrusted me with their very special and sensitive nest specimens. So Linnea Hall, Renee Carrado at the Western Foundation, Douglas Russell uh, at the Naturalist Museum in London, and Pascal Ekoff at uh, the Museum for Natural Kunde. My collaborators, Bobby Habig and David Lottie, who I think are on Zoom. Yes, they are. Nice to see you. Um, and then undergraduates, 
all the tissues alone, or the tissues alone me museums, all the museums alone me tissues. Uh, and again, I also really, really want to thank Mamoru Suzuki for the uh, for the amazing illustration that he provided for my dissertation. Um, I wanted to pay him and like commission him to do this piece, and he insisted that he just give it to me, and that is absolutely amazing. Um, so first. Now, thank you. Rory, <laughs> I did not put any embarrassing things up here and I really regret it. This, this is a picture of Rory and I when I was an undergraduate and little did I know at that time that he was slowly brainwashing me to want to work on birds. But, you know, since then, you know, I, I, I am very, very grateful for all of the support that Rory has given me and helping me shape each of my chapters, giving me really good feedback uh, as well as really allowing me the space to develop into my own independent researcher. I also really want to thank him for supporting me and supporting my undergraduates. Uh, Rory helped uh, help me get a lot of funding uh, and um, uh, resources that I needed to be able to allow my students to do their, to do their own independent projects uh, while, while I was here. So thank you for that. I need to thank the Bowie Lab. <laughs> um, you guys are great. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for the camaraderie and all the fun times throughout the year. I really, really need to thank Mackenzie and Cynthia especially for not only being great friends, but with also helping me with all of my research. Uh, you guys are the best. Um, now, I need to thank my parents. Um, ever since I was a tiny child, I have been obsessed with animals and I'm really, really lucky that my parents have always supported my interests. They've even dabbled in them to an extent by sending me <laughs> selfies of them with snakes while driving. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, my grandparents as well, my, my grandma, Jackie and Joe, who are down here, um, they've been incredibly supportive throughout my lifetime, um, as well as my brothers, uh, uh, Gilbert, Joseph and Danny um, have always been there to uh, be awesome. And um, yeah, so family, family is great. Uh, I need to thank my wonderful partner, Daniele. Um, Daniele has been so incredibly supportive throughout this process, which included while I was writing my dissertation, making me food, bringing me wine, like <laughs> taking care of our pets. Um, you're also an amazing adventure buddy and partner. Um, I'm so glad that you also enjoy herping as much as I do. And I also wanted to mention that despite the fact that Daniele observed me going through what was clearly the most stressful period of my entire lifetime, and that included like several meltdowns, he decided that somehow uh, I wasn't a terrifying monster and uh, proposed to me while we were on vacation a few weeks ago so we are now engaged that was wonderful um, yes class um no talk would be complete without anyone thanking their first child so i actually got ali my first year of my P uh, the first year of my phd and she has remained my literal ally think my entire uh, uh throughout grad school um, so thank you for making my life uh, so much better, Allie Bear. Um, I need to thank my roommates. <laughs> uh, we have largely stuck together throughout all of grad school as well. So from day one, um, you guys have been fantastic. Thank you for all the parties, adventures, and the beautiful outdoors and in the city, all the crazy nights. See, this is also the most like uh, G-rated photo I could find. <laughs> um, I could not have picked a better group of people to live with these last few years, especially during the pandemic. It was a blast. Um, this is just a subsampling of all of the friends that have been there along the way. Um, yeah, like all the people in the Bay Area, not in the Bay Area, um, have been there to be supportive of my uh, life for the last 10 years. And I am very, very lucky to have so many wonderful people in my life. Uh, and I also wanted to mention, um, in particular, Aaron Bauer, my master's advisor uh, throughout my PhD, was always a text message or email away to remind me that I was never alone in this process. And then I also want to thank all of you, the MVZ and IV community. Um, as Rory said in his uh, introduction, I basically grew up here in the MVZ for the last 10 years. Uh, never, you know, despite my love of animals as a kid, never in my life did I think I was actually going to, you know, get a PhD. I'm a first-gen college student, 
um, you know, I, I thought at most like maybe I'd like work in a zoo or something, but it was because uh, Carol Spencer decided to uh, uh, recruit me as a herpetology curatorial assistant uh, back in 2009. Uh, and since then, it's all just been a wonderful adventure. Um, and yeah, I, I, I am so glad and so fortunate to have spent the last 10 years in and out of this wonderful and amazing institution uh, with all of you friends and colleagues. Uh, and so that's it. <laughs>